This video is sponsored by Incogni. In a world so large, busy and complex, those that work in the public sector will meet people from all walks of life. Diversity is part of the package, and finding yourself in unpredictable situations may even be part of the job. But when a South Korean taxi driver picked up a stranger just to find that her suitcase was leaking blood in his car, he had no idea how to react. And as the story behind that suitcase developed, it left the country of South Korea in shock. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and today I'm bringing you something slightly different to the usual by reporting on a case that has just happened in South Korea. A lot of Western news reports seem to be getting some of the details wrong too, so it's time to set this one straight. By the way, welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. I report on true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if you haven't yet, please consider subscribing. And so, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Jong Yu Jong. Welcome to South Korea, folks. Although most of our cases tend to be in the country's capital, Seoul, found in the north, this story takes us to the southern coast, where we find the city of Busan. Officially known as Busan Metropolitan City, it is South Korea's second most populated city and is recognized as South Korea's southern economic center. With a population of almost 3.5 million residents and a GDP of 76 billion US dollars, this city has a rapid pulse as well as a mighty amount of money flowing. But for a brief moment, and since we've never been here before, let's focus on a few interesting facts instead. Home to the largest film industry in South Korea, Busan is known as the creative city. It's also the cultural capital for festivals and creative gatherings, and is the gateway of entertainment to Asia. See it as the equivalent of Melbourne in Australia, California in America, or Glasgow in the United Kingdom. When it comes to the outdoors, you don't get much better than Busan. With incredible beaches, hot springs, and breathtaking seaside views, it's a clear winner for anyone looking to experience both the arts and the sun. Now, Busan's government website seems to be quite persistent in talking about its seaport too, and that's probably because it's the sixth largest megaport in the entire world. Almost 22 million 20-foot shipping containers run through these waters every single year, which, by the way, is the volumetric equivalent of 730 billion litres of coffee. I don't think even I could get through that one. Anyway, Busan, like most of South Korea, is considered to be a very safe place to live. And this is probably why our case today received so much attention. On the topic of safety, there is one thing I wanted to talk about before we begin today's case and that is your own safety. The year is 2023, we are all talking about AI, and the internet has become somewhat of a necessity. We're all signed up to dozens of websites too, but have you ever wondered what those websites tend to do with your data? Every time you sign up to a website or subscribe to a newsletter, it often comes with a terms of service for you to accept. And it's likely that, by accepting the contract, you might be giving consent to your data to be sold and resold by hundreds of data brokers. Unfortunately, many of these data companies retain personal information like your name, gender, alias, shopping habits, and even your address. Which, by the way, can lead to impersonation, fraud, and much, much worse. This is where our sponsor, Incogni, comes in. Incogni helps protect your privacy by removing your personal data from the market. They do this by reaching out to data brokers on your behalf, requesting your personal data to be removed, and dealing with their objections. Simply sign up to Incogni with my link, create an account, and the automated system will immediately get to work for you. You're also able to see the type of data broker, what information they carry, and even their risk factor. Incogni has already removed 42 threats identified with my email address, and I've even had emails from these brokers to confirm that they've removed my data. Protect your online privacy today. Incogni is offering 60% off to the first 100 people who use my unique code, CRIME. I'll leave that in the pinned comment and the description down below. Thank you to Incogni for sponsoring today's video. Thank you to you folks for supporting us content creators. And now let's get straight back into today's case. Focusing on our story today, it was around 3am on Monday the 27th, 2023, that police received a phone call from a very concerned taxi driver. He had just completed a journey after being hailed by a young woman carrying a suitcase. She approached the driver before asking him if he could drop her off near a wooded area by Nakdong Riverside, which can be found near Hapo Station within Busan. Now, this wasn't a problem. 
the taxi driver had completed this route many times before. And although the journey with the customer initially appeared to be normal, the situation would take a very sudden turn when she exited the vehicle. Getting out of his car and taking the suitcase out of his boot, he noticed that something had seeped out from under the suitcase. And with the wet and stickily thick feel, the red substance chillingly appeared to be blood. The passenger didn't seem to take any notice of the concerned look on his face, and under the cover of darkness, it is likely that she never realised his discovery. Without wanting to cause a fuss, the taxi driver pretended that nothing was wrong, and after waving her goodbye, he watched her walk towards the wooded area. After she was out of his sight, he returned to the car boot, and after opening the door, he realised that the suitcase had left a small pool of blood on the carpet. Whatever was in that suitcase, was nothing good. And so, he did the right thing by dialing South Korea's emergency services 112 immediately. The news was concerning at best, and it certainly got the police's attention immediately, and after dispatching a few officers to that area, just a few minutes later they would find a few mutilated body parts. The dense woodland, which was shrouded in darkness, was the perfect place to dump a body. But thanks to the driver's quick thinking, the female passenger was identified and tracked back to her home just a couple of hours later. And just three hours after leaving the taxi, the young woman, who would later be named as Jong Yu Jong, was arrested. Data analysts reviewing the case were quickly able to identify Yu Jong through surveillance cameras in the area where she was picked up by the taxi driver. And with all of the evidence already stacking up around her, they had enough information to execute a search warrant to her residence. It is worth mentioning that, in South Korea, the names and details of victims and suspects of a crime are rarely disclosed in the media. This law, which has been in effect since 1991, ensures the safety and privacy of victims and offenders alike. However, under the country's Special Act on Punishment of Specific Violent Crimes, this privacy can sometimes be wavered, and especially when the crime is of a violent nature. Now of course, this allows society to be aware of potentially dangerous people. But back to our case today, who exactly was Jong Yu Jong? At 23 years old, Yu Jong was born in 1999, and from the information that is currently available, it is understood that her parents were sadly too busy to look after her. As a result, she was raised by her grandfather in the northern district of Busan's Bukgu. She attended a private secondary school named Kyun Gye Girls High School, and while there, her reputation was relatively unremarkable, if not a little on the strange side. Those who remember her described her as a rather peculiar student. She was quiet, often sat at the back of the class, and was more or less a loner without any friends. And I know that sounds like an insult, but that's exactly how classmates have described her. Although she was never bullied at school, Yu Jong never showed any interest in getting to know anyone. Most attempts to speak to her resulted in a blank stare back, and even after graduation, she barely kept in contact with any of her alumni. She then remained unemployed for five years while she prepared for a civil service exam, which in South Korea is a requirement to work in the civil service industry. Being able to speak English competently is also a requirement for this exam, and sadly is something that Yu Jong was dismal at. And at the age of 23, her English competency was considered at the same level as a high school student. Mind you, this is something to remember later in the story. In recent years, Yu Jong's isolation intensified. She would barely go outside, didn't create any social plans, and never tried to broaden her horizons. Now, she had also become a so-called true crime fanatic. Not that there is anything wrong with that, by the way. Anyway, she owned dozens of books and novels about murder cases, watched many Korean true crime programs, and had even become obsessed with specific serial killers. Over the following days, data analysts learned several interesting facts about Yu Jong. After going through her mobile phone, they realised that she had almost no contacts or messages, indicating that she was an extremely lonely young woman. What was most concerning, however, is that in the months leading up to her crimes, she had made several worrying searches online, including how to murder someone, murder without a body, and the perfect murder. Now, at first, Yu Jong denied murdering her victim, and instead claimed that someone threatened to kill her if she didn't dispose of the body. But of course, police found multiple holes in this story. After being begged by her family to come clean, she would finally confess just three days later. She would also admit to police officers that she had an uncontrollable urge to kill someone, because she wanted to know what it felt like. So, it appears that the motive was purely out of morbid curiosity to kill, which also explains why Yu Jong was happy to target a stranger. But who was her victim, and how did she kill them? Due to South Korean law, we don't actually know the face or even the name of the victim, 
So for the sake of this story, we're going to give her the pseudonym Jian. As we know, Yu Jong's plans to murder someone began around three months prior when she started her research online. She concluded that, since there would be no personal motive, it made a lot more sense to target someone randomly. However, with the social skills of a fish, she had to lean on the internet to do her bidding. After signing up to a popular tutoring app, she then pretended to be a parent who was looking for an English teacher who could tutor her child. On May the 24th, 2023, Jian was paired with Yu Jong. The two eventually agreed to meet a couple of days later on the 26th, with Yu Jiang saying that she would send her child to the teacher's house. Jian accepted the offer. It was after her plans were confirmed that Yu Jiang purchased a school uniform online, and on May the 26th, which was the day she scheduled to meet Jian, she pretended to be her fake child by disguising herself with the school uniform. Sliding a knife into one of her pockets, she then made her way to Jian's house, which was located in Guemjiang-gu. At a height of 4 foot 9 inches, or 1 meter 44, it is very likely that Jian did not question her age at the door, and after entering the home and learning that Jian lived alone, Yu Jiang brandished the knife and then murdered her in cold blood. And after making sure that she was dead, she moved on to the next stage of her plan. Yu Jiang then travelled home just after midnight, picked up her suitcase, travelled to her local supermarket, purchased knives, locks, zip ties, bleach and plastic bags, and then returned to Jian's home. A surveillance camera captured this disturbing footage of her happily walking between between the residences. What is awful is that she seemed excited and giddy in her steps, despite her very terrible actions. She then returned to Jian's house, dismembered her body into multiple pieces, and placed some of them in the suitcase. At around 3am on the early morning of the 27th, and after making the mistake of not securely bagging Jian's limbs inside the suitcase, she then called for a taxi. And after making her way to the park, she then disposed of the body parts. Wanting to make it look like a disappearance, Yu Jong made an effort to hide Jian identity. She did this by keeping her license, mobile phone, and purse. She also took the suitcase back with her to do a second round of dumping later that day. In Yu Jiang's own words, she had hoped to commit the perfect crime. But of course, as we all know by now, that would never actually happen, and instead she was promptly arrested. Although it's not confirmed, it is theorised that Yu Jong targeted Jian because she wanted to have what the tutor had, which was a high social status and a good academic background in English. Where Yu Jiang repeatedly failed her English exams, Jian had actually graduated in English from a very prestigious university, and so an element of jealousy may have been part of the selection process. Yu Jiang tried to delay her arrest by claiming that she was bleeding internally. But after being sent to the hospital and being found to be in good health, she was promptly rearrested. Looking into her mental health, Yu Jiang had never been diagnosed with any form of mental illness, and to add to this had a clean criminal record. So there was actually no way of predicting this murder. This of course was made further difficult with Yu Jiang's non-existent social life. Because she had no friends, she kept all of her dark thoughts to herself. Following her arrest, Yu Jiang confessed that she had dreams of committing the perfect crime. However, and even despite the taxi driver, it is very unlikely that she would have got away with this. Jian's DNA was found in her apartment, Yu Jiang's DNA was found in Jian's apartment, she had royally screwed up with a leaking suitcase, and she was even caught on several surveillance cameras. Interesting side note here, and one that is learned from covering international true crime cases, but South Korea actually has a four-factor psychopath diagnostic test. If you haven't guessed what that means, and by the way, I'm a little concerned if you haven't, but it's a test that allows psychologists and analysts to determine if someone is likely to be a psychopath or not. A score of 15 is considered to be average, where you're considered a psychopath when scoring above 25. Jong Yu Jong received 28 points, which is actually higher than the serial killer Kang Ho Sun, who scored 27. Those who have been here for a while will know that I've covered Kang Ho Sun's case about a year ago. After murdering his mother, he then went on to eat stray dogs and kill several other women before ultimately getting caught. So, Yu Jong scoring higher than Ho Sun is a pretty serious revelation. That is, of course, if this so called psychopath test has any real credibility. Interesting side note, but considering this score and considering Yu Jong's demeanour, Authorities actually believed that if she wasn't caught, she would likely become a serial killer. Anyway, after learning of Yu Jong's social position, police administration specialists stated that it is highly likely that she is a reclusive loner with low self-esteem. And understandably, most Korean news media 
media outlets have clung on to this description. In an interview conducted by NBC, Jong Yoo Jong's grandfather expressed his sorrow and shame by saying, I want to apologize a hundred times to the bereaved family for raising my granddaughter wrong. That's how I feel. Earlier this month, Yoo Jong apologized profusely as she stood outside the police station. In a statement to media, she said, I apologize to the victim and her family. I must have been out of my mind. As you can guess, this case gained a lot of attention in South Korean media. Many people were shocked due to its wildly impersonal nature. Jong Yoo Jong had no reason to murder, except to only satisfy her own sick curiosity. So what happens now? With this case happening so recently, Yoo Jong's trial is yet to begin given a date. She is still being psychologically examined before officers can even determine what charges she will face, though it is very likely to be murder in the first degree. South Korea does still technically allow the death penalty, though its last execution hasn't actually taken place since 1997, and although there are more than 60 people on death row, they will likely never face capital punishment. On the flip side, Yoo Jong may see a sentence as small as five years behind bars though it is likely to be much higher should she be found guilty. I don't really know what to think about this case. I mean, I understand that, being into true crime she probably learned a few tricks, I think the media wildly exaggerated her interest. Now, true crime is a rapidly growing genre in the modern day world, and to be honest, if it wasn't for that growth, I probably wouldn't be in front of this camera for you folks. I have already said this in another video, but when viewed with compassion, it can be educational, help us feel empathy for the victims, and even help us be more aware of our safety. It's obvious to see that Yu Jong was a recluse, and unfortunately very lonely and I think the void that was made through that loneliness created a very unhealthy obsession. That obsession, of course, to be the desire to kill someone. General disclaimer that watching true crime does not make you strange or weird, by the way. It is human nature to be curious, and this sort of genre allows us to explore the deep depths of the human mind. Another side note, but that taxi driver quit his job last week, so I guess Yu Jong was enough to prompt a career change. Anyway folks, I think I'm gonna wrap this one up today, but I'd love to know what you think about this case. Please share your thoughts in the comments section down below. I didn't really see the point in waiting for trial for this one, as it's kind of obvious that Yu Jong is guilty. But of course, I'll keep you updated when a sentencing happens, which is likely due next year. Anyway folks, thank you so much for watching another video today by coffeehouse crime, I hope you didn't mind the short one, and thank you to those of you who brought this case to my attention. Thank you again to Incogni for sponsoring today's video, if you would like 60% off their package then remember my code down below. Please like the video if you haven't yet, and consider subscribing if you find true crime interesting, and as always I'll be back again very soon for another video. You can find my social media down below if you'd like to learn more about true crime or simply follow my adventures, and if you'd like to get early access to my videos then please follow my Patreon. Anyway folks that is all for me today, thank you once again for watching, and as always I'll be back again very soon for another video. But until that moment arrives, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.